so much. I have two sister-in-laws here, two of Maxie's brother's wives that are so very, very special to me. Jan from Teton Valley, Wyoming, and Mary Ellen from down near Clifton. And we just appreciate all of you being here so much. And I probably have uh, one of the greatest honors of the whole lectureship, and that is to introduce to you Judy Miller. Um, and one of my earliest memories of being Christian, uh, of course, were the Jewel Miller film strips. And, uh, and we can just think of so many thousands and thousands of people that have been taught through these film strips. I first met Judy a few years ago, or I guess it could be many years ago, out under the big tent in Abilene, Texas, and visited with her that day. And I knew the moment I met her that I had met one of those uh, whose very countenance expressed the very essence of Christianity. And when we were singing that song, uh, Ever Strive to Keep Sweet, that's Judy. Okay, um, now she has some very uh, admirable credentials here. She's married to Jewel Miller. She said, tell them I'm married to Jewel. They have 10 children who are all faithful workers in the Lord. They have 24 update, expecting number 25 um, grandchildren. Um, Judy has done hundreds of ladies' classes and retreats and workshops across 34 states. Um, she, the, her latest award is the um, a Distinguished Christian Service Award from Harding University. And Judy, last night, several preachers and others were sitting around our living room, and credentials were brought up. You know, they were talking about all these masters and doctors. I, I said, look, I was had the book open. I was working on your introduction. I said, you men want to hear about credentials? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, they all got quiet after that. <laughs> Anyway, we're looking so far, and you're the one that should have been sent to Beijing instead of the ones our country sent. So anyway, we are so pleased to have you, Judy, and we uh, turn it over to you. Good morning. Good morning. I am so grateful to be here this morning and to see all of you. I thank you so much for having me. I look forward to it so much. And I don't know when I have been more uplifted and inspired by the singing and by the prayer and by the introduction. I do appreciate you so much. And seeing dear and wonderful friends, again, it just thrilled my heart. So I do feel as if God has sent a special blessing to me today and I am so very very glad to see all of you wish that I could have been here for the whole lectureship but I've been visiting with one of our daughters who lives in Arlington and had a good visit with them and with three of our grandsons and the only reason that I am on limited time today and have to fly back at 1 30 is because our youngest child Susan and her husband are expecting an adopted baby to be born uh, within the week and we are going just as soon as we receive the word because we want to be there just to, as we have been for all of the other children they have been unable to conceive and now this baby seems to be an opportunity of blessing for them and so I'm eager to get back and call her and tell her that the baby can come anytime right <laughs> I am an old-fashioned woman with an old-fashioned lesson this morning. But I believe in family and home more than any other thing in the whole wide world. In fact, if it were given my choice, I would insert or teach about the family and the importance of Christianity in the home more than any other subject. But I am so thankful that you have asked for me to present a lesson, and it was such a joy to write the manuscript. In fact, I took most of the lessons from my books. I just robbed them right out of my books. And so I'm going to be sharing with you some of the things that I really do believe. 
I believe that many women are floundering around today trying to find out where they can best serve our Lord. They're reaching out and they're hearing many voices, and these are conflicting voices, are they not? And so there are many reasons why women, especially young women, are confused about their roles today. And sometimes I believe the very confusion comes because they are looking to every source except God. And if we would only look to God and His Word, God's Word would direct us, God's Word would inspire us and lead us and lift us up and help us to find our true places that God has meant for us to have. No wonder women are so confused. God wants us, first of all, to live in His plan. And His plan is so wonderful, He's presented it to us in His Word. If we were only to follow His Word and to be directed by His Word and controlled by His Word, then we would not be so confused. Sometimes we plan our lives the way that we want them to go, but we need to plan them the way that God wants them to go. We seek God's approval for our plans, and it really should be the other way around. We need to let God direct our lives through His Word, the Word of God. What was God's plan for women in the beginning? I am sure through many ladies' talks and lectures and classes that you have discussed the beginning plan for the home and the church in the beginning of time. But I do not believe that we can hear it enough and we need to be reminded from time to time about our role and God's plan for our lives. In the beginning, we know that God created us to be help me for our husbands, one very special, one very suitable, and one very needed. We are to make up for what our husbands lack. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help me for him. We were created by God to be a helper, to be an encouragement to our husbands. In the New Testament, Paul who is, we know, guided by the Holy Spirit, wrote in 1 Timothy 5.14, Therefore I desire that the younger widows marry their children, manage the house, giving no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachably. And in Titus 2, 4, and 5, we are reminded that we are admonished as women to teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Well, when we read this, we wonder then, what is the plan for single and childless women? Are they left out of God's plan? Certainly not. God has a plan for all of us. But from these scriptures, we learn that a woman's primary role is in the home making and managing a home, building a home. And I believe that single women build a home. They build a home for God that glorifies Him. We have a single daughter in all of our ten children. We have six daughters and four sons. Right in the middle is Patty. Patty is 35 and she's a single girl serving the Lord in Little Rock, Arkansas as a teacher and as a fine worker in, in, in her in her ministries of teaching in her congregation. We also have the uh, youngest, our youngest children, a young uh, boy, our youngest son and his wife, are childless, as well as Susan, the one that is now expecting. But God has a wonderful plan for all of us. But the most sublime goal that a woman can achieve is having her entire family believe that home is the very best possible place to be. Someone has said that no nation, no church, and no home can stand without a woman in it. And I really do believe that that is true. A woman is the molder of all that is excellent, refined, and beautiful. An ancient proverb reads, If there be righteousness within the heart, there will be happiness within the home. And if there is happiness in the home, there will be harmony in the nation. And if there is harmony in the nation, there will be peace in the world. And just think of that. Where does peace begins? It begins with righteousness 
in the heart, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. The influence of a good woman is so far reaching, far more than could ever be estimated. God has always blessed the faithful service of a woman who fears the Lord. Proverbs 31 and 30. Well, what then is a woman's position? What stand is she to take in God's plan for her? In Genesis 1:27, we read, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created male and female in his own image, and both are of equal value. Yet God placed the man in the home as the head, and the woman in the home as its heart. In fact, I believe that we as women, wives and mothers, are the heart beat of home. We are the vital, throbbing force that keeps the home running in a Christian fashion. Man is subordinate to Christ. We learn this in 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of woman, the head of Christ is God. So, just as men are subordinate to Christ, we are to be subordinate to our husbands, but we need to have a healthy definition of that term subordinate. Subordinate means to be under. It means to be under the headship of our husbands, and I love that role. I do not choose to be the leader of the home. I do not want to be the discerner and the decider of all the decisions. I'm glad that that responsibility is my husband's. This does not mean in any way that we are inferior to men. We are to be in submission to our husbands. Because it was never in the mind of God that husbands should be tyrants or that women should be doormats. God simply did not plan it that way. Submission is a beautiful term. It's not spoken of now these days very much. But we need to remember that many problems in marriage come about because the wife is not in submission to her husband. To be in submission is a loving, caring thing to do. It talks about and speaks about her attitude, about how she feels about God as her head and about Christ as her king. When a woman truly loves and trusts her husband, she'll be happy to remain in the position that God has placed her in. Both men and women, as you will notice, have been called to have a yielding, submissive spirit to their God and to each other. And this defines our purpose and gives us infinite joy. Our primary purpose is to serve and glorify God with all of our hearts, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's very important, isn't it? In the fear of God, we are to submit to one another. Then we need to remember that there's a great deal said in these days and times about a woman's self-esteem and her self-worth, and many times her self-control. When I hear this term, I, I grow a little bit uh, leery about this, and I wonder why it's not explained in more Christian fashion by submitting to God and letting God have the control. We're God controlled. We are God submission, submitted to. We are, our worth comes from God. Our self esteem is really not self esteem, it should be God esteem. Because when we have self esteem, so often the uh, emphasis is put on the selfishness. And we read so many books and materials today about a woman's self-esteem of seeking self first, of pleasing self. The I is emphasized so much. We know, those of us that have lived for 65 or more years as I have lived, that this is certainly erroneous. It's when we submit ourselves to God, when we seek His reward in serving others, that we truly find our self-worth. It must be remembered that before Christ came, 
women were certainly considered inferior beings. They didn't have property rights. They were not educated. In fact, many thought that they were too obtuse to be taught. And so no one bothered with their education. Women were downgraded and they were subjected to much unfairness and injustice. It really wasn't fair. But what happened? When Christ came, when Jesus came into the picture, he set women free to be their own best selves. He did not set them free to do whatever they wanted to do, as many women teach and practice today. He set them free to be obedient to his laws and his commandments and his will. He gave them opportunities to know their self-worth and to grow and develop as individuals with talents and abilities of their own. Many of the women who were fellow servants of Christ, such as Darkus, Phoebe, Lydia, and Priscilla, had great abilities, and they were commend commended through the gospel for their good works. Remember Lois and Eunice? What are they most known for? They were most known because they were the grandmother and the mother of Timothy. And they set before us great examples of the importance of godly training in the home. I do not know of any other one thing in the rearing of our children, we had them home about 38 years in all, that gave me more rewarding pleasure than seeing that Christ was being developed and practiced in their lives, to teach them, to pray with them, to develop their spirituality, to see that come about in your grown children, and then to see your grown children teach their own children, and to teach it and to practice in the places where they are is the most rewarding gift that God can give any of us. And it's worth any amount of attention and time and effort that we spend with our children in the home. Many of us here today are older women, and I believe that this is certainly true when it comes to being a good example and influence and a teacher of our grandchildren as well. Don't you believe that? Well, Lois and Eunice shared their Bible knowledge, their truths that they had learned, and they imparted them to young Timothy's heart so that his faith grew as normal as living and breathing. And his young heart and mind were fed upon the gospel and the impressionable years in the home. Remember, the first five to seven years of a child's life are the formidable years. Those are the years that are so impressionable. We need to teach and spend much time with our children during those years. As a result of Christ's coming and Paul's teaching, women were elevated and esteemed highly for their work's sake. And it's precious for me, and I'm sure for you too, to read such passages as Galatians 3, 25 through 28 and realize our worth in Christ Jesus. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful teaching? I'll never worry about inequality again. I know I'm important to Christ, and so are you. When I was baptized into Christ, I came into Christ and Christ into me, and that makes all the difference. I'll never lose a moment's sleep over women's liberation. I am liberated. I am liberated, set free in Christ to obey him and keep his commandments. For Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now then, many people are talking about the role of women, the role of women in the home, in society, in the workplace, in the church. And what do I believe that a woman's highest role consists of? In a few words, I believe that a woman's highest role in the church and in the family is service and love. Service and love. A woman's full-time service is to love and to give of herself. 
whether it's in the church or the family. Paul wrote in Galatians 6 and 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. And we speak of the church as the household of faith, and I believe that that's a beautiful biblical term that we can also apply to the home. When we marry, we set up a household. What kind of household will it be? It should be. And we should strive for it and pray for it, that it will be a household of faith. It's so easy for any of us to become weary and well-doing for lack of encouragement from others and members of our family. And we are admonished to encourage one another in these words and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We are to encourage each other. The word encouragement comes from the Greek word paraklete, which means to come alongside and to help. And remember, helper, where did we hear that before? Helper was the first title that women were given, a helper. We are to encourage one another. I believe that if we have nothing else to do, that we need to seek to encourage our brethren, our sisters, our children, our husbands, our neighbors, our friends, and especially those who are lost and outside the body of Christ. Where are our older women when it comes to stirring up our younger women to love and good works? We need to remember that all of us are older than someone, and we need to encourage those that are younger than we are. Now, church work. We speak a lot about church work and what church work consists of. What is it anyway? Well, many times we feel like that a woman's work in the church is limited. It is limited by scripture, but there are untold opportunities in the church for, of our Lord for women to render services. And a woman is certainly not limited to staying at home, although the home is the primary sphere of her work. But a woman's work is as far-reaching as her abilities and her talents take her. But a woman's work for the Lord naturally begins where? In the home. In the home. When we speak of a woman's role in the church, we sometimes refer only to work that we do apart from our homes as church work. But I think it's time that we begin to reassess the meaning of church work. Church work is not even a biblical term. I believe that a woman who's been given a home, if she is a single woman, and the people that surround her lives, or she's a childish woman, they're a childless woman, there are many, many areas for her to teach and to encourage and instruct children. But I believe that if a woman who is married and does have children, whether there's one or a dozen children, has much of her church work already established to her. She must give her attention and her time to the members of her household of faith. The more children, naturally, the more demands on her time and her energies. Sometimes my energies kind of ran out with ten children at home. But the Lord gave me an enormous sense of responsibility and privilege in realizing that this was a household of faith that he had given into my hands. So whether you are single, or whether you have no children, or you have one child, or many, you know that your church work begins with those that are placed in your responsibility. And what a joy it is. Whatever time is left over, we should give it to others. We should spend time in visitation, in taking food and sitting up with the sick and all of the other service-related jobs. We might refer to this as other church activities because church work begins in the home. All our work as women, assuming that it is good work, is to be considered church work because we're the church 
And wherever the church is at work, that's where our work begins. <clears throat> but a woman needs to be very careful when she has a family to take care of, that she doesn't get so caught up in so many outside church activities that she neglects those for whom she's most responsible. We cannot do the world's work, can we? In fact, I don't want to do the world's work. I do not want to have any part of it. But we can do our own. We can do our own work that God has given us to do. And why don't we concentrate on that rather than worry about what the world thinks about what we're doing? Let's concentrate on what God has given into our hands to do. Someone has said that a woman who creates and sustains a home makes a man feel loved and understood and under whose hands children grow up to be strong and pure men and women is a creator second only to God. And that is true. It's a very creative thing that God has given into our hands to do. Now a woman doesn't need to feel pressured even in this day and time to compete with a man as many women are doing. They feel like they need to be as high a level or uh, make the same salary or to do the same kind of work or they feel slighted if they're not given as much attention. Many women feel that way about the church, don't they? I do not feel that way at all. Because man has his work to do and women has hers. And each is wonderfully equipped by God to do the work that he intends for us to do. I think it's important for us to make it clear and to find our sphere of service and be delighted with the health and the ability to do it. Home should be the place of peace and refuge for all who enter there or live there. And it is primarily the woman who makes it that way. For young mothers in particular, church work means homework. Women who are wives and mothers have the highest and most noble responsibilities and privileges placed in their hands. The responsibilities are great. They really are great, aren't they? But I want to add, they are certainly joyous. How I miss those days when primarily I was taking care of the little children in my home. But to be able to be a helpmate and companion of a godly man, and even if you're not married to a godly man, to be his helpmate and to encourage him along the way to raise his children, to guide and keep the home is our sweetest privilege. It is our highest calling. When our children were growing up in our home, I always thought of my home as a vineyard, as a vineyard where a garden was being cultivated and developed. And I felt like that I had been placed in that vineyard in a position of utmost responsibility as the guardian, the gardener and the guardian of my children's souls. And we know that the soul of a child is the loveliest flower that grows in the garden of God. What a tremendous responsibility God has placed in our hands. And we need to tend our gardens well. No one but God can know the final reckoning of the harvest but we must be the ones to cultivate the soil of our children's souls and hearts. And if we were to spend a whole life long just trying to cultivate a beautiful garden, it would be a very wonderful thing, but it would be of infinitely less important than the vital cultivation of a child's soul and heart. And this cultivation will last and eternity. In my manuscript, I have the poem, The Soul of a Child, but I believe my time is limited, so I would like for you to read it in the book. It's one of my very favorite poems, and it closes out with, In the breast of a bulb is the promise of spring, and the soul of a seed is the hope of the sun, and the little blue egg is a bird that will sing, In the soul of a child is the kingdom. Recently, I heard a story about a young girl who wrote to a Christian counselor that she wished above all else that when she came home from school that she would find her mother there. And I have come to the conclusion 
that one of the reasons for the prevalent breakdown of the American home is that mothers can no longer be found in the home. And I am sure that you will agree with me about that. In the manuscript, I have some statistics. I would like to increase the statistics that are found in the book because I believe from my recent reading that they're, they're even higher than they were at the time I wrote them. 50% of the American mothers of preschool children work outside the home. And one out of every eighth child, it's probably every sixth child now, will be born illegitimate. And more than 30% of children in America, perhaps it's even higher now, are living with a divorced parent. And these statistics speak of absentee mothers, don't they? In the Song of Solomon 1 and 6, we read, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. If we as mothers do not keep our vineyards, the little foxes are going to come in among the vines and spoil them. For our vines have tender grapes. Song of Solomon 2 and 15. Our little souls that are in our hands have tender souls. And the little foxes, the many voices of this world, like foxes, come in sly and devious. And our children are listening to these voices that are calling, 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 calling them away from the gospel and the principles that their mother and daddy should be teaching them in the home. And our children are listening to these voices. They are. They are listening to them. They come over the radio, over the TV, through all the medias, in the, in the newspapers, in the books, and even the textbooks in the schools. And if we do not take up our sentinel post as keeper of the vineyards, we will wake up someday and find that our children have been spoiled and corroded by the evil foxes of the world. I find that there are many days. It was certainly true when I was a young mother rearing so many children. I wanted to have the wings of a dove that I might fly away and find rest, as Psalms 55 and 6 suggest. But mothers are sorely needed at home. In the tender years of, of uh, preschool and adolescence, too, they are just as much needed then, even more so. Proverbs 27 and 8 says, Like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. We need to find the place where we are needed the most and stay there. For we know that a child left to himself will bring his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, 15. In my book, It Only Takes This Far, I wrote a little piece that I thought about very deeply while I was writing it, and since I have written it, I have believed that it is even more true now than it was at the time that I wrote it. And it is called, If I Am Not at Home. And it goes like this. Who will tell my daughters that the sweetest thing about them is their expression, and the sweetest thing is their smile? Who will teach my sons that the kind of companions they choose will play a large heart in their character formation? Who will be there to listen with the heart to all their problems, struggles, and confusions? Who will show my girls that being a homemaker, wife, and mother is the very best career in the whole world? Who will provide cleanliness, order, and control? Who will be there to cuddle and hug them and gentle them if I do not? Who will pour honey on their hearts as well as milk upon my children. Who will praise their successful achievements? For what good is the accomplishment when there's no one there to praise, too busy to care? Who will read aloud to the children and teach them that words are fun and books are very, very important and can be their very best friends? Who will teach the girls to cook and sew and work with their hands? And who will laugh at my children's antics and cut up with them when they feel like being silly? Who will express love to their father in their presence so that they will see that marriage is wonderful and beautiful? Who will comfort them in their sorrows and cry with them when they want to cry? Who will help them, sit with them, stay by them when they're lonely, 
discouraged are ill, who will tuck them in at night and send them to bed with a kiss if I am not there, who will support them and build up their, their esteem in their growing up years, who will pick up after them, do their laundry, cook for them and mend their clothes, who will show them life is like a song if the song is not sung from my lips. Who will show them God and point them to the Heavenly Father? Who will point out the daily miracles of their lives and teach them that each season is a season to be celebrated if I am not at home? I personally feel that a woman serves best from her home. I believe that this is the biblical role. But for those women who must help with the living or the family, or at least to supplement it, I have admiration and, and respect because this is a must. And I really advise when I am asked that if you do not have to work while your children are in their form formative years, if you do not have to, wait. Wait a while because there are going to be many years in which you can pursue a job or career as long as it doesn't interfere with your husband taking care of him in the latter days of your life. After our children grew up and married and all left home, they've all been gone now for about eight years when our last daughter was married, uh, I pursued a, a hobby that has become a career that uh, I was developing during the years when the children were home, and that is writing and speaking. And I appreciate and love and have so many beautiful memories of the years when they were growing home, 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 in the home, and that's what I write about and that's what I speak about because that's what I know best. But I'll always encourage a woman who has to work for a living. There are many single women rearing children that have to work for a living, never to feel guilty. This is what they have to do and we need to respect and admire the many, many facets and hats that they have to wear. Even though a woman has to work for a living, we know that there's plenty to do in the home, even if she is a single woman. Our daily work is so important, isn't it? I believe that we should use all our minutes, our hours, and our days to the glory of our Heavenly Father. This is what we were put on earth to do. And everything we accomplish, no matter how small, should be an offering to Him for all He has done for us. We need to remember all He has done for us and let our daily work reflect our gratitude. Our daily work is a part of God's plan, isn't it? And it's a very appropriate part. The woman who keeps busy and interested in serving others by the work of her hands is a happy woman. She's a joyful woman. She has no business getting worried about others, time to brood, or feel sorry for herself. The fullest life is a life that is empty for others. And this is so true. We need to put that in practice. When we as Christian women can clearly see the picture of God's love is focused on the cross, then you and I can understand our roles. There will be no confusion. We can respond to this love with trust and with confidence and with serenity and with reliance that will color all that we do with beautiful artistic colors. So much has been written and said by the feminists about a woman's rights that some women feel guilty about staying home and taking care of the members of their family, baking bread, sewing small scenes, and reading Bible stories have almost become a thing of the past, haven't we? But we have choices to make. And I hope and pray and really covet prayers for you that I will make the right choices just as I pray for you about your choices as well. Joshua declared in Joshua 24, 15, 
And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that has been the motto of Jewels in my home for 48 years. This is a firm declaration, isn't it? A firm declaration of faith on the part of Joshua and the entire family. Who is it that makes the decisions in the home about the directions little children will go? And who decides what values and character traits are going to be taught in the home? And who sets the examples of godly living in the home? It's the mother and the father. Early in the marriage of two people, they choose whom they will serve, whether it will be the pleasures of this life or the riches of Christ. So we as mothers and wives must make a daily decision to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Why daily? Because day after day after day, Satan tries to get at us with all of his might, hoping to defeat our commitment to the Lord. And he is extremely subtle, endeavoring with every trick at his disposal to make us believe one lie after another. But we must be strong to see through his devices, to find strength to overcome temptations which are presented to us daily. God wants to rule in the hearts of every member of the family. In a very real sense, the mother and the father in the home must make the daily decision to love each other, to love their children, and to train and guide them every day. Albert Schwarzer once said, There are only three ways to teach a child. The first is by example. The second is by example. And the third is by example. It comes from our example, doesn't it? When we say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, we are making a commitment before him that we'll not put anything or anybody above our service to our Heavenly Father. And little children, even though they're very young, they cannot help but sense the love and the commitment that their father and mother have for the Lord on a daily basis. What heritage are we going to bestow upon our children and our grandchildren? The greatest heritage of all is a strong faith in the living God. Christ must be placed supremely in their lives, in all the little tasks, all the little decisions, all the little discussions, all the little actions, all the little songs, all the little choices. As a result, our children will grow up and they will know that just as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. The people followed his example and they said, we too will also serve the Lord for he is our God. That is the example that we set before our children. Do you want to rear children who will become godly servants and active participants in the kingdom of God? Then it's absolutely imperative that you choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. We are called to full-time service. A woman serves the Lord best when she serves her family first. Think of the oh so many opportunities for Christian service that a woman's work brings to her, but it naturally begins in the home. And I believe that as older women we are instructed to teach the younger women to be keepers at home. And I believe that this means that they're the organizer of the home activities. A woman's world. What does a woman's world consist of? A woman's world as she lives in Christ Jesus and practices every day the principles of the kingdom are different from a woman in the world. What are the areas in a Christian home where a woman needs to realize her importance and how valuable she is to her family. Think of all a woman is in her home. We must be woman, wife, mother, daughter, sister, friend, neighbor, and homemaker. Think of all that a woman does 
in her home alone. She is housekeeper, nursemaid, cook, laundress, dishwasher, food buyer, gardener, manager, chauffeur, dietitian, bookkeeper, dressmaker, religious instructor, teacher, family correspondent, and much more. And the world tells me that I need to go out of my home to be fulfilled. Help! If I were any more fulfilled, I would explode. The value of basic importance is being faithful to a commitment, to a commitment. Failure to fulfill responsibilities will bring disappointment and grief. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Well, the best part was introducing her, and the worst part is having to stop her. <laughs> you have to put a stop to her sometime. <laughs> oh, that was so wonderful. Thank you. Can you take the questions? Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Don't you wish everyone in the, every woman in the whole wide world could have heard this? Well, if, if I don't... St get us stopped in here and back in there. I'm going to have to answer to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at this time, we're going to ask Sue Keel to come forward and dismiss us. And wasn't it wonderful to be here? And thank you so much. Also, update. Uh, the book says she has written 12 books. It is now 14. And if you want a listing of her books, they are so wonderful. So... Get them if you can, because she is a wonderful writer also. Okay, Sue, thank you. A little bit of heaven on earth, don't you want to go to heaven? 